Hello. In this video, we will continue our discussion of the use of substitution in evaluating integrals, in this case, definite integrals. We will also consider how we use the symmetry of functions to cut back on some of the work that we need to do involving integrals with symmetri symmetric functions. Let's first look at the definite integral from 0 to the natural log of 3 over 8 of e to the 4z divided by 1 plus e to the 8z dz. Considering our work previously with substitutions, let's, let's let that denominator, 1 plus e to the 8z, be our u, our substitution. Then the derivative of u with respect to z is 8 times e to the 8z, and du is going to be 8 times e to the 8z dz, and solving for dz, we'll get du divided by 8 times e to the 8z. So when we go to make our substitution, I'm going to get e to the 4z divided by u times du over 8 times e to the 8z. Just for a moment, we'll have a mixture of the z and the u. And simplifying things a bit, I'm going to pull that 1 8 out in front, and I've got the integral from of 1 over u times du over e to the 4z. Now we can work with our u equal 1 plus e to the 8z to make a substitution for that, or replacement for that e to the 4z. So subtracting 1 from both sides, I'm going to e to the 8z equals u minus 1, knowing that e to the 4z is the square root of e to the 8z, so I'm going to get the square root of u minus 1 is equal to e to the 4z. And I look at that, and I realize that that does not match one of our basic uh, formulas for integration. Bummer. So we need to try a different substitution. So before we make a substitution, let's reevaluate this expression. And let's see that e to the 8z, just as we said, is e to the 4z squared. So then, if I look for something where I've got 1 plus something squared in the denominator, I can see that that may be uh, an application of the inverse tangent function and its derivative. So let's try this substitution. Let's try w equals e to the 4z. The derivative of w with respect to z is 4 times e to the 4z. And therefore, e to the 4z dz is equal to 1 fourth dw. And I'm solving for e to the 4z dz because I see e to the 4z, I see e to the 4z dz in the numerator there. So then making our substitution, I've got e to the 4z divided by 1 plus e to the 4z squared dz becomes 1 over 1 plus w squared times dw over 4. So I've got that function portion written entirely in terms of w, which is great. Now, what to do with those limits of integration? We actually have two choices here. We can leave the limits of integration as they are, evaluate the integral at the limits of integration after we undo the substitution at the very end, so after we've found the antiderivative. Or we can change the limits of integration when we make our substitution. So when we make our substitution changing w to be, changing e to the 4z to be w, we can also change anything involving z to be in terms of w. And then evaluate the integral with the new limits of integration. We're going to do both methods here. As you practice with the definite integrals, you might get a feel for, and preference for one method over the other, but in general, either one works. So we're going to first leave the limits of integration as they are, but to make sure that it's clear, we're going to keep z equals natural log of 3 over 8 and the z equals 0. We're going to make it clear that those are z values and not w values. So I'm going to pull that 1 fourth out in front. I see that I've got the arctangent of w times 1 fourth, and I, evaluate, I can't evaluate that at the limits of integration just yet because those are z values, not w values. So I first undo the substitution, and now I've got z back into my function, 1 fourth arctangent of e to the 4z, and now I can evaluate that uh, at natural log of 3 over 8 and then subtract off arctangent of e to the 0. And when I do that, I get pi over 48. Now let's look at the same problem with the same substitution. 
but this time change the limits of integration. So knowing that z equals 0, when z equals 0, w is equal to e to the 4z, or e to the 4 times 0, which is 1. When z is equal to the natural log of 3 over 8, w is equal to e to the 4 times the natural of three, log of 3 over 8. Using the rules of um, exponents and logarithms, I can simplify that to be the square root of 3. So therefore, when I make my substitution, e to the 4z divided by 1 plus e to the 4z squared, dz becomes 1 over 1 plus w squared times dw over 4, and I'm integrating with respect to w as w goes from 1 to the square root of 3. I again see this as 1 fourth times the arctangent of w, and I can simply and quickly evaluate that function at our at the values of square root of 3, subtract off what happens when we plug in 1, and again I get pi over 48. Now initially this might seem like it's easier, seems like fewer lines of work, but it was just a matter of evaluating those limits of integration near the front rather than undoing the substitution and evaluating them at the original limits of integration near the end. Again, it's a matter of preference, however you'd like to proceed. Graphically, we can see that when we look at the integral from 0 to the natural log of 3 over 8 of e to the 4z over 1 plus e to the 8z dz, we're looking at the area of this region right here. When I change my limits of integration and I integrate 1 fourth times 1 over 1 plus w squared dw, and I go from 1 to the square root of 3, I'm looking at the area of this region. And you can see that either way we got the same answer of pi over 48. We get the same areas, but graphically they're from very different, very different looking functions. It was kind of cool to see and, and reflect on that perspective as well. So again, summarizing our, our method, when using substitution with different definite integrals, we can first keep the limits of integration. So when I'm integ integrating f prime of g of x times g prime of x dx from a to b, making the substitution of u equal to g of x, the derivative of u with respect to x is g prime of x, du is equal to g prime of x dx, making the substitution, I'm making, again, making it clear that I'm going to keep the original limits of integration, but I'm also making it clear that I'm key, that's, those are aligned with the, my original variable x. They don't match up with the u. I go ahead and find the antiderivative. I undo the substitution, so I've got f evaluated of g of x, and now I evaluate those at the uh, limits of integration, so I've got f evaluated g of b minus f evaluated g of a. So that's one method that we can use. A second method is to change the limits of integration. And so the same integral, f prime of g of x times g prime of x dx, x going from a to b, same substitution u equal to g of x, du is equal to g prime of x dx. Now I say, well, if x is equal to a, that lower limit of integration, then u is equal to g evaluated at a. And similarly, if x is equal to b, then u is equal to g evaluated at b. I put those in for my limits of integration after I've made my substitution. Once I find my antiderivative, f of u, I can now simply drop in g of b, drop in g of a, and I get the same result. Now we're going to look at a slightly different topic and consider symmetric functions and when we integrate over a symmetric interval. So suppose f is continuous on a symmetric interval, symmetric just being it's, it's the same side of, in this case, of 0, same, same distance from 0 on either side, so from negative a to a. If f is an even function, and you recall an even function is a function which is symmetric about the y-axis, so that y-axis is a, is a line of symmetry. So algebraically, that works out to be that when I evaluate the function f at negative x, I get that original function back, f of x. So when I integrate an even function over a symmetric interval from negative a to a, that integral 
is the same thing as just doubling the integral from 0 to a of f of x dx. Now, if I have an odd function, and as you recall, an odd function is a function that's symmetric about the origin, or algebraically, that means if I evaluate the function f at negative x, I get negative f of x. And you can go back and review some of this in, in a pre-calculus textbook or uh, even an algebra textbook, or in chapter one of your textbook, um, you can review the, those topics, even in odd functions. But if you integrate an odd function, f of x dx, over a symmetric interval from negative a to a, you're going to get zero. So let's consider an example. Suppose we've got f of x equals 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x. You might suspect that that's an odd function because it only has odd powers. If we evaluate 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x on the interval from negative 1 to 1 dx, first of all, we notice that negative 1 to 1 is a symmetric interval. And graphically, it seems reasonable that the area under the curve here matches the area under the curve here, with the exception that when a region is below the x-axis, we say that that has, quote, negative area. So it seems like these two regions will negate e each other. Likewise, these two regions will negate each other. So the only thing that we must show then is that f of x, in this case 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x, indeed is an odd function. So I evaluate f at negative x. So wherever there's x, I plug in a negative x. Negative x to the fifth is simply negative x to the fifth. Negative x cubed is simply a negative x cubed. And so I get negative 2x to the fifth plus 3x cubed minus x. I can factor out a negative 1, and indeed I get a negative 1, negative f of x. So the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x dx is 0. Let's now evaluate the definite integral from negative 1 to 1 of the absolute value of 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x dx. Graphically, anything that before was below the x-axis is now reflected to be above the x-axis. And let's consider, let's call g of x to be the absolute value of f of x. So it's the absolute value of 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x. We want to show that we're working with an even function. In other words, that g of x is an even function. So we do that by verifying that g of negative x is equal to g of x. Well, g of negative x is going to be the absolute value of f evaluated at negative x. So we pull that negative out in front once we evaluate um, 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x of, at negative 1. And we indeed show that we have an even function because we get back to g of x. So next we want to find the zeros. Well, why do we want to find the zeros? Well, we need to know where, where the function was negative and where it was positive before. So it was positive from 0 to this value right here on the x-axis, and then it was negative before. So we need to know what this value is, or symmetrically, that value, so that we can know where we need to take the positive value of the function and where we need to negate uh, the negative portion of the function. And when we factor that, we see that we get zeros when x is equal to 0, x is equal to the positive or negative square root of 2 over 2, or positive or negative 1. So when I, using the fact that we've got an even function and I'm integrating over a symmetric interval, the, ne the definite integral from negative 1 of the absolute value of 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x dx is equal to 2 times the integral from 0 to 1 of uh, the absolute value of 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x dx but wanting to make sure I get the positive portions of those, I'm going to get 2 times the integral from 0 to the square root of 2 over 2. That's the location of that 0. 
of 2x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x dx because already my function was above the x-axis on that interval from 0 to the square root of 2 over 2. Now from the square root of 2 over 2 to 1, the function was actually negative. So we're going to take our original function and negate it, which we see here. Uh, so I've got the negative 2x to the fifth plus 3x cubed minus x, and I'm going to integra integrate that from the square root of 2 over 2 to 1. At this point, things are fairly simple. We've got constant multiples of powers. And then finishing this out, we get 1 fourth. So when we handle symmetric functions over symmetric intervals, we can is when we recognize that it's a fairly powerful tool that saves us some work. So go and practice these items and have fun with it.